Uh, Jeremy, on the topic of learning new things, you mentioned today that your colleagues were peeved when you spent half of, half of the time learning new things. Uh-huh. How did you how did you stand your ground? I don't know. <laughs> Just bloody minded. I don't know. <laughs> Um, was it because you're so productive that it didn't matter? No, no, I mean, it matters. Um, I mean, most of that time, I was either the manager of a management consulting team or I was the CEO of a company or whatever. So, like, I mean, my first two startups, I wasn't exactly CEO. Nobody had titles. I had co-founders. But, um, yeah, in the end, it's like, this is how I do things, you know, so, um, but I'm not going to say it didn't create friction. I mean, I don't know. What do you think, Hamill? Like you work with me and you see how I jump onto totally different things when we're meant to be focused on something. Is it like, um, I actually don't see unusual? you, I don't see you getting distracted that much, at least for me. Like we're it talking seemed... about APL right now when we're meant to actually be focused on releasing NB dev and we're meant to be doing the course. I and, see. You know, it's like Okay, no, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. Like um in in hindsight, it looks like it was all part of a like a genius plan. Oh, but, like okay. <laughs> while you're doing it, it's like, why are we doing this? That's how I feel sometimes. But then it's kind of like uh that thing we did with Rich. I don't know if you remember. Oh, that, with uh, that. G- with uh, with um, GH Top, with uh, with uh, your old CEO, we we reset yeah, yeah. his um, yeah his thing using Rich. Yeah, like we spent so much time doing that, and while while we were doing it, I was like, why are we? You know, at some point, I was like, I don't know if this is worth it, or you know. But then, at, at like uh, you know, Will mentioned that he started his company based upon this that project. And I thought, wow, that that's a really big impact. Uh, and yeah, so, like, yeah, yeah. So then I just kind of learned over time that it actually you can pivot these things into something productive, usually. Yeah. So this this company, Textualize.io, Will, who created it, said came out of Hamel and I refactoring there we go this is still the most recent one so nobody's touched it since this rather mega PR um, which yeah basically took rich and made it do things that we hadn't exactly expected it to do this is quite funny because I think yesterday or, or two days ago, I went to this website, textualize.io and I was thinking, hmm, what does this do? Like, how are they planning on selling it or what's the plan? I mean, the, the website is beautifully designed so I thought that there must be some business entity behind it and I just thought, yeah. So that's Yeah, so it's basically, you know, one guy, although I think he might have, he's got some funding, so I think he's hired somebody to help now who loves building CLIs. Um, and so what Hamill and I showed with our GH top thing was that actually you can like use another tool he's created called Rich to kind of get a long way towards building terminal user interfaces. And um, um, yeah, this is something. It's, it's come full technique. circle now, now that, Somebody's using Textualize to build a notebook in the terminal. That's true, which is <laughs> which is great. All right. Um, so uh, since I'm on the Mac today, let me just check something. If I switch to a different virtual screen, you guys can now see my terminal. Is that correct? Yep. OK, great. Um, Um, yeah, so since I'm on the Mac, um, I just um, downloaded that Jupyter kernel, and I unzipped it, and I ran install.sh, and um, it looks like I now have a 
dialog APL thing here. So one thing that's happened since yesterday is we now have a GitHub repo. Um, which, let's have a look. APL study, there we go. So I don't have that over here, so let's grab it. So I'll go copy. Yeah, so we've got a fast AI slash APL dash study. And really all that's in it at the moment is my notebook. And so I should be able to now get clone that. There we go. And so I should now be able to open that. Good. And theory, I should be able to run it. Hooray. OK. Oh, and then the other thing we did was we installed that toolbar widget thingy. Oh, which I've actually already got here, so that's good. Um, so I guess I have to go bookmarks. Shift Apple B. Okay. APL. Great. So uh, let's see if I can type back tick two. Yep, that works. Okay. So I'm back up to where we were on the different computer. Um, So let's do times and divide, shall we? Um, and I guess I should also run dialogue. <coughs> and we should also get up our help, which was called dialogue language elements. Cool. All right. Let's do times. So at first, it feels a bit weird that um, times and divide are actually on hyphen and equals. But then you realize that like plus, minus, times, and divide are all kind of next to each other on the keyboard. So it's not quite that weird. Um, I seem to have got used to it pretty quickly. So we can do two times three. Um, so that makes sense. Um, Damien, how did you get the APL keyboard on top of Jupyter Notebook? It's it's if you go to the forum. Oh, it's on the forums. Okay. Um, I think did we discuss it yesterday? I don't quite remember. Maybe we didn't. I, I saw mm -hmm. there was a some uh, JavaScript thingy yeah. that loads, but I just didn't know where to take it from. Yeah, OK. So specifically, the steps are um, you there we are. Here's the bookmarklet. So you click here. And then you, as it says, you drag this to your bookmarks bar, this this link. And then you go to the Jupyter web page and you click that link in your bookmarks bar and it'll appear. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, and this thing is called, not surprisingly, time sign. And the two forms of it are, OK, direction. And multiply, oh, it's actually called times, OK, times. OK, 
Okay, so um, obviously we can multiply a scalar by a scalar. We can multiply a scalar by a list. And we can multiply a list by a list. And remember, just because there's no space here doesn't mean this is one times two. This is this list times this list. So space binds more tightly. Does that make sense so far? Yep. Okay. Now, monadic times is taking us into um, um, complex world again, which is fun. Um, let's see what it says, direction. So again, we look over to the top right, and it says R is the result of doing times on Y. Y is any numeric array. Okay, when an element of Y is real, the corresponding element of the result is an integer whose value indicates whether the value is negative, zero, or positive. So this is what we'd normally call the sign function in most languages. Um, and often in math, it's called that as well. Um, and so just to check here, 3.1 is positive. So that returns one. Negative two is negative, so that returns negative one. And zero is neither, so that returns zero. Okay, so those ones okay? So this is showing us the sign, which they call direction. Complex numbers. The corresponding element is a number with the same phase, but with magnitude of one. It's equivalent to this. Um, so let's find out what this does. I think that'll give you the absolute value. Um, yeah, magnitude, they call it the absolute value. So direction. is what does that mean for a complex so is that going to give either i or negative i <laughs> i guess we should try it is that just a regular bar Let's see it is okay um so it's actually something a bit more interesting. I think this is going to, yeah, I mean, if you visualize it as a vector, right, it's just going to normalize the vector to magnitude one. Yes, um, that's going to require some drawing, I think. I just want to get up the uh, documentation to see how they describe it. Magnitude of a complex number. Okay, great. So we're going to do some more complex number stuff, which is cool. I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, so I think so far the glyphs for monadic and dyadic are the same. For all the glyphs that we've looked at, except for Nick and minus sign, which uses a different one. Do you know why that is? No, they're, they're always the same. Always the same. Yeah. I think what you might be getting confused about is the difference between um, 
the thing that lets you specify a negative number, which is that, versus the function, which takes the negative of an array, which is that. Oh, I see. That's not a function. This binds more tightly than a function. This is actually, this is more like, the dot here is not a function, right? It's part of the literal number 2.3. Okay, is it the same as, as the J? negative's not part of is not a function, it's part of the number negative two point three. Okay, thanks. No worries. So I if I do this, this is not saying apply the negative function to these four things. It's saying this is a list containing this negative number and this and this and this positive number. So if I wanted to negate those four things, I would have to do this. Yeah, so hyphen is a function, and this uh, upper bar thing is just part of a number, not a function. Just like dot is part of a number. Just like j is part of a number. Jeremy, so this uh, JavaScript uh, uh, keyboard, it gives uh, when you hover over a symbol, it gives these uh, key bindings that work with a regular uh, keyboard, not APL keyboard. Uh -huh. But it would be preferred to use the APL keyboard, right? And to no, not at all. Um, they're the same. There's the difference is an APL keyboard has pictures of those letters on them, but they produce the same things. You still have to have the same software, whatever. So the only reason to have an APL physical keyboard is so that you can look at the keyboard and oh. see the, the symbols. No, no. Uh, I got it. I was thinking about the APL keyboard in Windows. Uh, oh, in Windows? To. OK. Because, because um, these, these things, uh, the JavaScript uh, applet thing here, yeah. it gives you other key bindings that work with the regular keyboard, like uh, you know, like XX tab is for multiplication. Yeah. Oh, okay. So don't. I suggest not using those. Instead, use at the very bottom. It says backtick dash. Use that one because those okay. are identical to the Windows keyboard. So you just use backtick followed by the same letter you would use in the Windows keyboard. And so here, this one is backtick equals. Yeah, I would ignore those tab ones. Okay. But uh, this also works with just a regular Windows keyboard. Should I be using the APL keyboard? Like, yeah, you can use the Windows APL keyboard if you want. Um, I so I'm not using that right now because A, I'm not on Windows. But B, even on Windows, I actually prefer not to use it because it takes away my control key, and I like my control key. Yes. So, yeah. so the backtick notation, the one on the on the bottom here would be the, the preferred one. It, it's what I'm liking so far, but obviously I'm very new to this, so I don't take my word for it. But yeah, I, I like the backtick approach because it- I um, tend to use that as well. That's we use copy and paste and everything in the usual way. Yeah. Um, okay, let's talk about complex numbers some more, shall we? Um, So, um, yeah, I, you know, this is one of those things I didn't really get into much at university. I mean, I wish somebody told me how cool they are. Um, uh, turn on my... Yeah. Okay, so the thing I guess we talked about yesterday is how we can create this like uh, complex number plane, right? And so along this axis, you've got the real number line. And then along this axis, you've got the imaginary number line. OK. So. You can put 
numbers there. For example, here's the number two, and here's the number minus three i. But you could also create the number here, two plus two i. Okay, so that's the complex number two plus two i would go there. Um, and you can think of that as a vector, right? It goes from the origin and it goes up to there. There's another way of thinking of two plus two i. And that vector has a length and we can calculate its length because it is, we have here a right angle triangle. So we have a right angle triangle. And its height is two, and its base is two. So its length here, we can get from the Pythagorean theorem. That makes sense so far? So um, that is the magnitude of this complex number. So the magnitude of real numbers is easy, right? Because like, what's the magnitude of this number here? Well, it's how far away is it from the origin? And the answer is three. You know, what's the magnitude of this number here? Well, that's easy. It's one, right? This one's also easy, three i, what's its magnitude? What's distance from the origin is also three. Right. Um, but yeah, the ones where you've got a mixture of imaginary and real, you have to use the Pythagorean theorem to find out their magnitude, a single number, which is like, how big is it? Um, and um, if we take a number, so this number, the number we, we were dealing with here was two plus two i, which um, APL writes like this, it means the same thing. And um, um, they have this thing called direction, which is basically saying, take a number, for example, like uh, three, and three, the direction of three is plus one. And the direction of negative three is negative one. And basically what we're doing is we're taking the number three and dividing it by its magnitude. And that's another way of thinking about this sine function, right? So like, what, what do you do in, in for a complex number well, you take the number and divide it by its magnitude to do the same thing. And so that's going to give you something that is going to be, um, you know, around about here. So it's going to be pointing. It's going to be pointing in the same direction. Oh, excuse me. It's going to be pointing in the same direction, but it's going to be shorter. And specifically, we can draw this really important thing, which is called the unit circle. And the unit circle is something that has a radius of one, right? <clears throat> and it's centered on the origin. And so the um, direction, anytime we get the direction of a real, we're going to get something that points in the same direction as the original number, but is actually sits on the unit circle. Its length will be one. Does that make sense? So we could try it, right? So, um, so what's the square root? of eight, 
So we could do eight to the power of <coughs> negative two. Um, that's not right. Uh, sorry, it needed to be to one, the power uh, of half, half, rather. God, that was embarrassing. Negative two or half, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so we thought if we took 2j2 and divide that by um, 8 the power of a half, um, we get that. And if we get the direction diagonal times of 2j2. Hooray! It's the same. So, um, and rather than writing 8 times 5, what I could have written here is magnitude of 2j2. Because that's what magnitude means. Okay. So, uh, does that make sense, what it's doing? Um, you'll notice that, like, although complex numbers are about this i the square root of minus 1, we don't think about that at all, right, when we're doing this complex number stuff. we. Um, we just treat it as a, a pair of numbers, which therefore can represent a point in Cartesian space, and therefore that can represent a vector. And um, uh, is that zero point seven radians? Like, what is that value? No, this is a um, this is a complex number. It's zero point seven j zero point seven. So it's zero point seven plus zero point seven i, because remember, two plus two i is written as two j two in um, in APL. So this is 0 0.7 plus 0 0.7i. So it's a complex number. And so it's this, it's this point here. It's the complex number that has the same direction as 2j2, but has a magnitude of 1. And therefore it sits Good. on the unit circle. And like, we really like to do things on the unit circle because on the unit circle, um, so if we kind of draw that out a little bit more, um, if we stick to things that are on the unit circle, so here's one, 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 minus one, minus one. So these points, are nice because you can pick any one of those points like here, right? And if you create that triangle, then this hypotenuse here, the length of it is one, which is really convenient, right? Because if you're doing like trigonometry or something, right? You've got like sine, theta, Sokotoa equals opposite over hypotenuse, well, that's always one on the unit circle. So we can um, we can delete that part entirely. Instead, we get sine theta equals opposite. You know, so it's it's we it's nice to deal with stuff that's on the unit circle. Things become more convenient. We can ignore the whole magnitude slash hypotenuse piece entirely. Um, trigonometry coming back, huh? Probably a lot of us haven't seen it since high school. All right, so what do we say about monadic times? Um, we haven't introduced magnitude yet, so let's put that away down here for later. 
And for now, I guess we'll just say um, that um, the magnitude of 3J4 is um, equal to um, I guess we don't have a way of even doing a square root. So we'll just have to kind of do it with pros. So the magnitude of 3j4 is equal to the square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared. So that's 9 plus 16. Uh, oh, yeah, of course, 3, 4, 5 is a Pythagorean triple. So um, it's basically going to be, uh, we're going to be dividing by, um, Five. Yeah. So, um, so basically, um, three, um, three J four means um, three plus four I. Uh, which has a magnitude of 25 because um, it has a magnitude of 5 because 3 times, well, I guess we should use this, 3 times 3 plus Four times four equals five times five. Um, um, so zero point six J zero point eight. Um, uh, represents a vector in the same direction as uh, as 3J4, 3J4, but with a magnitude of 5 since it's um, 3j4 divided by 5. OK, how's that? So that's dyadic times. Um, now, that does mean that we just use divide, and I don't want to use anything until we've introduced it. So um, we should probably do divide first. And divide, I think, is actually a bit of an easier one. OK, so divide, which is on the equals sign on the APL keyboard. Divide, here we are. OK, so that's called divide sign. Divide sign. The monadic version called reciprocal, recip, reciprocal, reciprocal. Did I spell that right? Recipro no, reciprocal. reciprocal. And the dyadic version is called divided by. Or divided by. Okay, and I guess what we could do is grab all of those and paste them in here. And I wonder if this works. Can we go find times and replace with divide? Oh, lovely. There we go. Okay, so divided by is easy. 
Um, does anybody here not know what reciprocal does? Maybe we don't. Oh, we can't do zero. Okay. Um, let's change this to three. And as a side note, I found the reciprocal to be kind of handy when I'm doing any square roots or cube roots or anything like that. Because then you can do, rather than doing the 0 0.5 power, you can do 16 to the reciprocal to the power two, the reciprocal of three. Reciprocal each, for example, yeah, so a cube root, you could do the cube root of eight, like so. Mm, and I guess. I think you need those parentheses. Yeah, exactly. I don't think we need the parentheses because first it does it one at a time, right? So it's going to do divide. So this is going to be the first thing it does is divide three, which is reciprocal of three. And then it's going to be tie, uh, power of. Uh, on the left will be eight, and on the right will be reciprocal three, which is cool. So it's like function composition. Yes, um, it it is, um, which is actually a great time to talk about that, because um, we've now got our four basic operators from math. Um, and so we should now talk about precedence. Um, and I think I want to change my headings a little bit. Um, pick one array. Um, I'm going to create a section called basic math operators. Oops. Wait, what have I got here? I got plus sign twice. Should I do something weird? Dyadic minus, monadic minus, plus sign, monadic plus. Okay, just dyadic plus, divide, dyadic, dyadic times monadic. Dyadic. Okay, precedence. So um, here is the formula three times two plus one. Okay, so in regular math, we would go three times two first and get six, and then we'd add one and get seven. And there's a couple of reasons we do that. The first is that times is a higher precedence than plus. And even if it wasn't, we go left to right. So is this seven? No, it's not. And that's because um, uh, APL makes things much simpler for us by having no concept of precedence of different functions. They all have the same precedence. And the rule is we always go right to left, not left to right. So this is the same as this. Um, and that's good because you wouldn't want to rem remember precedence rules for all, what are these, like 50 or 60 or whatever glyphs, right? So they all have the same precedence. Um, that doesn't mean all symbols have the same precedence. We've learned of a few symbols that have different precedence. So for example, space, right? Three plus four space two. Space between numbers binds more tightly. Um, I guess this would be better to explain like this. This binds more tightly. So this is the list three, five added to four, or the array three, five added to four. 
which is the same as that. So when I say we're doing things right to left, I'm only talking about functions, right? And remember, that upper bar thing is not a function, right? That's part of the number. And this space here is not a function. That's part of this array. So functions specifically are, you can tell something's a function because you look it up in the help and, um, oh, I thought it'd tell you it's a function. Ah, okay, we can see here it's listed under the section called primitive functions. Okay, so we can tell that this is a function because it's in the functions part of the help. Um, most of the things up here are going to be functions. Um, as we'll learn shortly, some of them are operators, and the rules are different for operators. But most of these, if everything we've seen so far in terms of times, divide, plus and minus are all functions. So that's the rule. We go right to left. So um, in this version here, right, we go right to left. So, okay, we've got the number three. Now we've got three divide. Okay, well, that means the reciprocal of three. And then we keep going left. We come across this time, this power of, and it has a right-hand side, and it has a left-hand side. And that's why this is eight to the power of a third. Does that make sense? Um, so we could do that with a list. And so remember, the symbol space binds the most tightly. So this is the list one, two, three, multiplied by two plus one, because we go right to left. So we go one plus two times this list. So that'll be three times that list. Um, and we could also do this. So this will be this list to this array, 246 plus 2. So all that in brackets. And then multiplied by the array 1, 2, 3. So 2 plus 2 is 4. 2 plus 4 is 6. 2 plus 6 is 8. 8 times 3 is 24. 6 times 2 is 12. 4 times 1 is 4. Does that make sense? Um, yes, so uh, I'm not sure if that's uh, related, but that uh, a function for giving us the magnitude, direction it was, I think, uh, that would, for an array, it it still works on each uh, component. It, 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 it doesn't normalize the whole array. Right, right. Basically... Um... Pretty much all the functions in their normal forms work element-wise, like NumPy does, um, including power and reciprocal and magnitude and so forth. That's a good point. Uh, did you go over the power of symbol? I don't know if I don't yet, remember. No. Okay. Um, I thought we might do that now. Um, I think that kind of counts as a basic math operator, kind of. Um, so... Yeah, so let's do, okay, so this is confusing. This is shift eight. The normal multiply sign from Python doesn't mean multiply. It means exponential or power. So, and it's called star.
Okay, and dyadic power. Um, so exponential means e to the power of. So this is e to the power of zero is one. E to the power of one is 2.718. And e to the power of two apparently is 7.389. Um, does anybody um, not know what e is or want a refresher? what E is? Yeah, refresher would be great. Sure. Re refreshers are always great. So. <laughs> sure. Um, the only reason I can do all these refreshers off the top of my head is because I've done all this stuff with my, you know, my daughter and her friend recently. So I can, I can do math refreshers like this. I've, uh, I'm ready. <laughs> About a month ago, I couldn't because I'd forgotten everything. Um, So E, the basic idea is like, if you put $100 in the bank, right, at 100% interest, then after one year, you'll get $200. And specifically, that's your original 100 plus, sorry, uh, I should say um, times 1 plus the interest. And 100% 100 is 100 over 100, so it's 1. Um, but uh, the bank might not give you the whole, you know, and might not calculate the whole thing at the end of the year. If they want to be a bit more generous, they could calculate it twice. They could calculate it once at six months and, and again after another six months. So you take your $100 and after six months, they would give you half of your interest. So that's 50%. So after six months, you would have 150. And then uh, in another six months, they would give you the other 50%. But the other 50% is now going to be calculated on this, right? So this is times 1.5. And then again, times 1.5, 225. Which is 100 times 1 plus 0.5. squared. Um, if they're really generous, they could pay it quarterly. And if they paid it quarterly, then the amount of money you're going to make is 100 times 1 plus, actually, let's do this as a fraction rather than as a decimal, a quarter, pair of 4. Or they could pay it daily, 100 times 1 plus 1 over 365 to the 365. OK, so we should be able to um, calculate these things in APL, right? Um, no promises. We could give it a go. So let's do this one, 100 plus. 100 times 1 plus a quarter to the 4, 100 times 1 plus a quarter. Now, a quarter is that. It's a reciprocal of 4. 1 plus a quarter. Okay. To the power of is this. 
And so this is going to happen first because we go right to left. Um, actually, let's say you don't have $100 in the bank. Let's say you've got $1 in the bank. Okay, so in that case, your $1 would become $2 if it was paid just at the end of the year, or it would become $2.25 if it was paid every six months, or it become $2.44 if it was paid every quarter, or we could do 365.5. If it's paid every day, it would be this number. And you can see, the more often it's paid, the more money you're going to get, right? But like, initially, you know, initially, it went up pretty quickly, but now it's going up pretty slowly. So let's say it was paid hourly. Um, I suppose it's paid 100 times per day. And it's not really making much difference at this point. Um, e is the limit of this as this number gets really, really, really high. So we could write that in math. And we can say E is the limit as um, whatever, x goes to infinity. So as x gets really big, but never hits infinity of, okay, and the one times we can just ignore, right? So it's the limit of one plus one divided by x brrr, brrr, to the power of x. Does that make sense? That's E. How's that, Radek? I just remembered the definition of limit. Wow, that's something I have not seen in ages. Yeah, and I gotta yet, say, um, the, the, the kids thing. loved seeing limit, you know. And of course, they're immediately like, well, just get rid of it and put infinity there. I'm like, okay, let's put infinity there. One plus one divided by infinity. Okay, kids, what's one divided by infinity? Zero. Okay, what's one plus zero? One. What's one to the power of infinity? One. Okay, so does E equal one? No. So, okay, well, what do we do? They're like, well, what about infinity minus one? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, that's still infinity. <laughs> um, so this was our so first cool. introduction to limits. And they, they were just like, they were partly like, wow, that's so cool. And they were partly like, never show me anything like this again. This is wrong. Yeah. It shouldn't happen. Get it out of my life. <laughs> no, but, you know, but, 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 but this is beautiful because like they're trying to make it concrete and somehow relates to the, to these ideas. That's amazing. And uh -huh. they will understand it at a much deeper level than people, you know, just, you know, going through this uh, reading theorems in, in a classroom. And uh, yeah, that there's something deeply disturbing about limit. Yes. And I guess like, like the takeaway is that this is just something that people agreed to, right? This is... What well, limit? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's. I think it's more than just something people agree to. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's some kind of reality, you mm -hmm. know. Like it's, it's a true, it's a true thing that that exists independently of our discovery of it. Um, right, but how do you make the jump from something getting closer to something being that value that it gets closer to? This is a definition. This is like a. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, I mean, I think it's really cool. Yeah. It um, is cool. It is cool. All right. So that is um, that is monadic, uh, monadic star. And E is named after Euler. I think Euler, as more specifically, Euler named it after himself. Uh, famous uh, blind Swiss mathematician. But uh, Euler did not discover E. Um, I, I don't know 
who did, but it won't, it wasn't him, even though he got to name it somehow. Um, um, for those of you that remember calculus, you know, you can take the derivative of various functions. For example, we saw in um, the fast AI class that the derivative of x squared is 2x. Um, one of the things that's interesting about e is that the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Um, it, it, it has a lot of crazy things going on with e and comes up a lot. Um, the Maybe the most cool, beautiful formula in the world is Euler's identity, which brings together a lot of the things we've seen so far. And it's e to the i pi plus one equals zero. Or to put it another way, e to the i pi equals negative one, which is like total madness that this thing, which is about circles, and this thing, which is about imaginary numbers, and this thing, which is about compound interest, somehow combine to create negative one. Um, so that's mind blowing. And so that's what uh, that's why monadic star is e to the power of e to the power of is a pretty important thing. And so we don't need a special symbol for e, right? Because anytime you want e, you just write this. All right, and then, okay, dyadic star is power of, so 49 to the power of a half is square root of 49. Five to the power of two is five squared. Uh, minus four square root is two i, because it's equal to um, minus one times so you get the square root of minus one, which is i, times the square root of four, which is two, two i. All right, is that a good place to stop, I guess? A, yeah, go. I think this is the first time e to the i pi has actually made sense to me, because I did make the connection that uh, pi is essentially like, I think like a half, like a half uh, circle in radians or something. Uh -huh. yes. And so i is just, that other uh you know i guess like the y on the plane yes. so all you're doing is you're just curving that around to the other side to get, turn it into a negative one add one onto that and now you got zero um yes exactly and maybe wayne you can try to find like a really good video or something that explains that for people that have never seen that before because i think that'd be a great thing to put in the, in the oh yeah uh i think there's a channel three blue one brown may have some stuff if i see yeah. anything i'll uh, put it up yeah Ideally, something that doesn't use any concepts that we haven't come across yet, you know. Mm -hmm. I'll keep yeah. my eye open for that. Yeah, I mean, the key thing around complex numbers for me, I think, is this idea that um, if you multiply by negative one, you flip something from one side of the, um, you flip something from one side of the number line to the other on the real plane. Um, ditto if you multiply by um, negative one for a complex, for an imaginary number, it flips it to the other side of the number line. Um, um, but if you multiply something by i, it rotates it by 90 degrees. You go from 2 to 2i to negative 2 to negative 2i back to 2. And so, yeah. Um, And I think a lot of these ideas end up basically being these kind of rotations around this number plane. Yeah, you see stuff like that all over in engineering. I think for me, when I made the connection that um, if you look at the I as kind of a shorthand uh, for having an array of two numbers, like basically just coordinates on a plane, um, and that's just a way to to kind of have that mapping to your number line, all of a sudden everything else starts to fall into place. And then when you're talking about magnitudes and stuff, I'm like, oh, wait, I've seen this before as like, uh, you know, magnitudes in, well, I mean, when you're, is it like the L2 norm or something like that? It's like, even if we're just having yeah, like the magnitude of like, absolutely. in fact, it's the exact same thing. Absolutely it is.
Wasim put this in the chat. What's this about, Wasim? Can you tell us? Oh, so it looks like the Jupyter kernel has a way of rendering, I don't know what to call that, like function composition. So if I type this into Jupyter? Yeah. Like that? Mm-hmm. And then what am I missing? Uh, run the cell. Do you mean the, the parentheses? Like execute just that oh, execute as that? is. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. It gives us the expression tree. That's beautiful. Okay. We will uh, come back to learning about that um, about that later. But yeah, you can basically put a bunch of functions in a row and it does interesting things. Uh, if you get rid of the parentheses. No fever, goodness me. All right, thanks, gang. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. everybody. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, have a good one. Yeah.